worship. Have fun this morning. This is a great morning to just be together as the body of Christ and worship.
sound wonderful this morning. I just want you to stay in this worshipful place. We're going to continue to sing. Lift your voices, lift your hands, whatever you need to do to be in this worship this morning.
the start for the beginning of time. No point of reference. It spoke to the dark, fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, Every burning star a signal fire of praise. Creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise. Don't speak in vain, syllable empty your voice. Once you have spoken, nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, Where you lost your life 
Hey High Point, my name is Jordan Merck and I'm the Director of Worship here at High Point. I have a few things for you this morning. Uh, the first is on October 24th, we're going to have Parent-Child Commitment. And this is for you parents, if you are looking to commit your parenting to God here, and also allowing us as a church to come around you and to make that commitment with you. So, if you're interested in Parent-Child Commitment, um, and you're in person today, there's a little slip of paper on your chair. With all the info, fill that out and drop that in the giving box on your way out. You can also let us know on your Connect card whether you're here with us in person today or in the virtual Connect card, which can be found in the High Point Church app. Uh, we're also taking nominations for our elder team. And so um, just a couple of reasons for that. Uh, our elder team is on this cycle where every few years an elder will roll off and then we'll bring another elder on. Um, also, if we have an elder moving um, for whatever reason, then we will need to obviously fill that spot as well. So we're actually looking to fill two spots. And so right now we're just taking nominations and we're taking names. And so um, if you're here in person with us today, there's a slip of paper. You can fill that out, nominate somebody, and drop that in the giving box on your way out. You can also go to highpointchurch.org, click on what's happening, and you can fill that out whether you're at home or, or you need to do that later this week. Lastly, is we have our student um, fall festival coming up on October 29th, right here at the church building. And this is going to be for all of you that are in 7th through 12th grade. Um, just a time to come together, have some great community, um, celebrate, have candy, games, and all that good stuff. So we really encourage you parents to be there and drop your kids off on October 29th for our student fall festival. As I go, I just want to send you a quick reminder that the High Point Church app is kind of the hub of everything where you can find all the information, you can find the podcast, list of small groups, events, and all that good stuff. So make sure whether you have an Apple or Android that you go to the app store and you download the High Point Church app. Other than that, have a great week and we'll see you next time. Well, good morning. I'm Brad Merck. I'm a member here at High Point. Let me move the table. Jordan told me to make sure it's on the X, probably so it can get my good side, which it's going to take a lot more than that to get a good side. Um, I am uh, having the privilege this morning of uh, leading you along as we continue in the book of Matthew. Kevin uh, was blessed to be able to spend the weekend in College Station, Texas, rooting on in person his beloved Aggies as they defeated the Crimson Tide. 
And uh, that was, it was actually a historic win in a couple ways. And uh, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking that uh, some of you who have some good-natured trash talking with Kevin over college football were probably really struggling yesterday because on one hand, you had to root for Alabama because you knew the alternative. <laughs> and the alternative happened, and it's coming. So I'll be praying for you this week as Kevin tears you apart. Oh, I'm sure he'll be humble about it. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's humble about Texas A&M football. Well, as, we, uh, as I said, we're going to continue in Matthew chapter 18. I would encourage you to take your Bible out, use your Bible app, and go to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start on verse 12 today. And Kevin finished on verse 10, and uh, I'm going to start on verse 12. So that leaves the question, what about verse 11? And I'm sure in um, most of your Bibles, in, unless your Bible is older, there is no verse 11. And the reason is, is because the early Greek manuscripts did not have that verse. And at some point, probably a scribe, well-meaning, uh, put what was to become verse 11 in there. It actually is found in Luke, so it is biblical. Just somebody put it there, and the correction was made. And so that's why there's no verse 11. So we'll start with verse 12. What do you think? If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the 99 on the hillside and go and search for the stray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over that sheep more than over the 99 that did not go astray. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If, the, if he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen... Take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let them be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on heaven will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two, or you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Lord, let us take this word today. Let it uh, be both through the written word and also through the spoken word reflective of your absolute truth and glory and not the words of a man. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week... Uh, Kevin spoke to the first part of the chapter, and one of the great things about how God put his word together is the continuity. And so this is all still part of the same idea. This all fits together. We're not stopping and starting with a new topic. And last week, uh, Kevin explained very clearly the use of the metaphor of children for the followers of Jesus Christ. So this is written to those who have proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we now go to the metaphor of sheep. And that's very commonly used in the Bible to talk about God's people. Uh, obviously, in a pastoral uh, setting that these people lived in, they would have been very well attuned to this. And so what we see first in here is we see that God's love compels him to seek us. You know, there's a story, and Luke talks about it in Luke, in his, in his book, in chapter 19, and it's the story of Zacchaeus Many of us are, are aware of Zacchaeus by the song we sang in Sunday school. He was a small man. Uh, Jesus was coming by. There was quite a large crowd. Zacchaeus could not see over the crowd, and so he climbed a tree. And Jesus points him out. He actually calls him by name. He says, Zacchaeus, come down here. I need to go to your house. And he goes to Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus, who is a tax collector... And Kevin has explained that, how despised they were by the Jews. Zacchaeus repents of his sin. He, by what we learn here, accepts Jesus and the gospel. And, and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. And it's really a microcosm of what God does to us as believers, where he calls us, he reaches to us, and then we react. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, says this, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens 
in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself and according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. What a great assurance that God knew before the foundations were set, before we were physically ever even close to being here, that he was going to reach out and grab us and pull him to him, pull us to him. That's how important we are. That's how, how he is compelled to seek us. And so he knows the individual from the herd. And by the way, right as I read that in first service, I thought, wait a second, sheep, herd, ah, that doesn't match up. Shows you, you know, I, I grew up in the, in the hard streets of Kent, Washington. So, you know, not really, in, you know, into animal husbandry. But, I, you know, flock, obviously. So you'll excuse me there. He knows the individual from the herd or from the flock. Psalm 139, verse 13 says, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Think about that knowledge. That for each and every one of us, he purposely and specifically put us together exactly for his will, for his glory. That's great assurance for us, that he knows us per that personally and that intensely. Luke communicates this in chapter 12 and verse 7. He said, indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. I mean, talk about the precision there of his knowledge of us. Now, some of us, there's less hairs to count. However, there's still a lot there, and he has the precise number for each and every one of us. That's how intimately he knows us as individuals. We're not just part of a flock. We are chosen by him. We know we are able to call him Abba, Father, to call him Daddy. That's how intimate that relationship is. Now, at the same time, the 99 are still safely in his embrace. God is not somebody who multitasks. He is not a multitasker. In fact, anybody who knows the research on multitasking knows that nobody is really a good multitasker. And if you're saying, well, I am, I'll just tell you flat out, you're just not as bad as other people. But multitasking is not effective. God does not multitask in any way. When he is searching for the lost sheep, he is still firmly protecting the flock. He does not have to do one or do the other. He's not like a binary computer that even though they seem like they're doing a whole bunch of things at one time, they're really doing one operation, and then when you want to go to another one, it switches real quick to that one. God is all of the omnis. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient, and he is omnipotent. He doesn't have to switch and look at different things. I remember years and years ago, uh, I was coaching basketball, and another coach, we were talking, and, and I'm not sure you know, the, exactly where his faith was, but we talked about something related to that in the game. He says, well, he says, I'm, I'm pretty sure God's got more important things to worry about the score of a game. Well, I don't know that he's worried about the score so much in the terms that we are, but I, I know that he's worried about every, not worried, but he is concerned and knows about every single thing that happens. There's nobody beyond his care and his understanding. Psalm 91.1 says, The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. And Nahum 1.7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. So we take refuge in him. He's caring for us. There's no exceptions. Also in this passage in Matthew, we see very clearly, because for one thing, the word rejoice is there. He rejoices in the return of the believer to him. Second Chronicles, chapter 30, in verse 8 and 9, says, Don't become obstinate, 
now like your fathers did. Give your allegiance to the Lord and come to his sanctuary that he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that he may turn his burning anger away from you. For when you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will receive mercy in the presence of their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. He will not turn his way, face away from you if you return to him. What we are talking here, folks, in terms of the sheep who is lost is the follower of Jesus who for some reason has started to take sin and has started to reason his or her way into why that sin is acceptable in their life. Why they can go ahead and live life with that sin. That's what this is about. Most common one would be anger. I have a right to be angry and have that, those angry thoughts about that person because of what they did to me. That's the type of thing we're talking about. There's all kinds of rationalizations we make about our sin. And so what we're seeing in this passage is a believer who has rash, is rationalizing and is walking away from Jesus. Except for one thing that's very clear here is that they're not getting away from Jesus. Because when it says he's searching, this, does not, this is a figure of speech. When Jesus says that, he's not mean that somehow he's looking around. Where could he be? He's right there all along. Because remember, the sheep know the shepherd's voice, and they hear it. And for someone who's walking away and is a follower of Christ because they're living in a sin that they need to, uh, to repent from, they're hearing the voice, and they think they can ignore. But that voice is there. It never leaves. And the rejoicing... Maybe we need to go back and remember the original rejoicing. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we, are also, we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfect of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Maybe what that follower of Jesus who has rationalized sin and has started walking away needs to remember is the foundation of their faith. The fact that there was a day, and they remember it well, when God reached down and opened their eyes, their ears, and their heart. And they heard for the first time, truly heard, that Jesus, who is fully man and fully God, came to earth, lived a life of perfection, and then willingly and with joy went to the cross to die in place of us so that we would not have to pay the price for our sin, which was to go to hell, to be eternally in a state of punishment separated from God by our own choosing because of what we wanted in our lives. But for joy, the joy, rejoicing joy, Jesus endured all of that. And then he was placed in a tomb. And on the third day in the very physical body that he went in the tomb, he walked out of that tomb. And because of that, death was defeated for us so we could live eternally with the Lord. Sometimes we lose track of how deep that rejoicing was of Jesus on the cross when we think about the agony that he had to endure when he was temporarily separated from his father. But that will help us when we think, yeah, I've been walking away. I've been rationalizing this sin. I've been thinking it's okay because and we make all kinds of excuses. I'd encourage you today. That if you've been viewing sin as something that you can manage, something that is okay for a time being because you feel like you deserve it, turn right now. We just read scripture. says he's not going to turn away. He's right there. He's calling to you. Turn. Repent. I'm here. Everything's going to be fine. I love you. Think of what I did for you. 
and what I will continue to do for you. Now, as we get to the next section, starting with verse 15, this is not a change in the message. This is a continuation of the same message. And if we look at it, we won't read back through it, but if we look at it, refresh our, our memory of it, it says if a brother sins against you, so it is a given that what has happened is sin. It doesn't say if you think a brother sinned against you. A sin has taken place, so we are to go personally and rebuke that person, it says. In other words, make that person aware of the sin. And if the person says, I agree, and they repent, it's all done. It's forgiveness. We move on. There's, there's nothing left. However, if the person will not do that, then we are to take one or two others. So in the witness of two or three, all the facts can be established. If the brother or sister still will not admit to the sin, then it says we're put it in front of the church. Now, there are some places that churches, they, they take that very literally in front of the whole congregation, and they will talk about it. Uh, a few years back, I was involved in a very difficult situation as an elder. And we had this type of situation where the person uh, had, uh, was embracing a uh, sinful attitude. We addressed it. We encouraged the person. And, but the person said, I know that's a sin. However, I can't do anything about it. I will not repent of it because the person felt justified. And so we asked this person to please not attend until the sin was repented for and then would be welcomed with open arms because it's dangerous to a church to have people who are actively embracing and living their sin. And so there is a need to confront sin in the church. The original instance we have in the Bible is a story about a man and wife named Ananias and Sapphira found in Acts chapter 5. And the basics of the story is Ananias and Sapphira sold a plot of land. They brought it before the apostles and said, we sold the land, here's the money for it. Now, why did they do that? Well, most likely because if you read back into uh, right before that, you'll see Barnabas son of encouragement, did exactly that. He did get of all his money. But Ananias and Sapphira were lying. They held back some of the money. Peter, who was heading up the church, said, you had no obligation to give any of the money. You could have given whatever you want, but you lied and you grieved the Holy Spirit. And God's sovereign judgment took hold. And first, Ananias, Ananias was struck dead and carried out. Three hours later, Sapphira came, and she was on the same line, and the same thing happened. Now, this is the apostolic age. I'm not making in any, any way a, a tie to today. This was God's sovereignty at the time, but it was absolutely clear that the sin that was coming into the church was dangerous and needed to be dealt with. 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 1, deals with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and removed from your congregation, the one who did this? Even though I'm absent in the body, I am present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Sin needs to be confronted in the church, but the real reason for church discipline, our purpose is for restoration of the believer. That is the purpose. The purpose is not for a bunch of self-righteous people to say, these are the rules you broke them, get out. The purpose is out of love. We are confronting the person, putting it right in front of them. This is a fellow believer and saying, you are, you are absolutely going against what God wants for you. 
And you are hurting not only yourself, but the church. And so as we look at this, we need to keep this in mind. Look at Galatians 6, chapter 1. Excuse me, Galatians 6, 6, verse 1. I'll get there. You guys are there, but I can't read it on the screen. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens in this way. You will, be ful you will fulfill the law of Christ. Gently, with love. Carrying one another's burdens. See, what, what Jesus did not say is, hey, if somebody is sinning, go start talking to people about it. The irony of that, and it happens, people say, well, you know, I don't want to gossip, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be um, righteous here. But hey, did you hear about so-and-so and what they're doing? Oh, yeah, oh, oh, poor person. That is, ironically, sin because it's gossip. Paul lists in a number of places all kinds of sinful behavior, and gossip may be the most common sinful behavior in a church because it's the easiest. So our purpose isn't to go around telling other people how somebody's sinning or how they're not lining up with God's Word. Our purpose is is to go to the person out of love, out of gentleness, really out of humility, because we've been there too. There's not a single one of us in here who call Christ Lord and Savior who has not been in that position where we've rationalized our sin, thought we could walk away from God and he would kind of ignore us, not realizing the shepherd's right behind us the whole time, calling our name. And so our approach needs to be from a position of love. Now, I'm going to give you a real-life example of this. I'm actually going to name names. Two guys named Paul and Peter. And uh, it's quite an amazing story. And we find it in Galatians chapter 2. This is Paul speaking. Verse 11, he says, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew... How can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? <laughs> this is, I mean, I don't want to be irreverent in this, but these are two heavyweights of the faith. Peter and Paul. And can you imagine that scene? This is Peter, who, head the ch who heads the church in Jerusalem. Peter is the, this is the post-Pentecost Peter the one who's filled with the Holy Spirit, the one who preached a message one day and 3,000 people came to the Lord, the one who could walk by somebody and through God's healing, his shadow would heal people. Peter had also, as we see in Acts 10, had had a dream. And in that vision, God had dropped a sheet and it showed all kinds of animals that under Jewish law had been unclean. And God said, do not, Peter, call anything unclean that I've made clean. And he is actually also talking about people. And yet, here comes Paul. And Paul has the nerve to address Peter. So what's Peter's response? Kind of interesting. About 10 or 15 years later, here's what Peter wrote. This is 2 Peter 3.15. Also, Regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given him. It doesn't say it in here, but I think Peter accepted it. I think Peter acted on it, and I think he loved Paul. 
Wouldn't you love to be called dear brother or dear sister all the time by your fellow believers? It couldn't have been easy for Paul. But on the other hand, he was following what God had, what Jesus had said. We must, in love, in gentleness, in humility, go to our brother or sister and address when they are living in sin because of how dangerous it is, not only for the individual, but for the church, for the unity of what God wants. You know, today... As I said, you may be, have realized, you said, yeah, I'm that sheep who's walking away. But you, you don't understand what I've done. And I, I'm not sure I could be forgiven. Let me tell you this. In Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39, Paul says, there is nothing at all that can separate you from the love that is in Jesus Christ our Lord, even yourself. And if our love is absolutely in Christ, then our love is going to be absolutely for those who need to know that and need to be reassured and brought back. Because here's the thing. Why does Jesus spend so much time on all this? Here's why. Because each and every one of us is vital to his church. That's the big C church. Each and every one of us. Paul talks about the parts of the body, and one part can't say we don't need you. All of them are vital. We are all that valuable to the Lord that he spent this time explaining to us through his word how we can love each other and how we can help each other follow him, keep our eyes on him. That's how valuable we are. And that's what he wants for us today. And that's what we need to be united in. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, perfect and holy. I thank you that it cuts right to the marrow. And I thank you today that uh, on this particular day, by your sovereignty, for the people who needed to hear it, which is actually every single one of us, that you brought this word. I thank you that what you're going to do through this is free people from misperceptions, free people from fear, and allow them to keep their eyes focused on you and to move in a direction that gives you glory. And so as we sing this song, Lord, which you designed and put in place uh, so perfectly with the message, uh, Lord, let us open and be true and allow you to work in us as you would see fit by your will for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you guys to uh, stand, and we're going to sing one last song this morning. the 
with giving, I would invite you, if you are visiting, just have the, uh, the blessing of your presence be your giving. And if you're a regular and attender at High Point, this is your home. I'll uh, ask you to either give physically when you leave or those of you who are at home and also any of you would like to give online. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you've given us materially because you've given them to us so we can use them by giving them back to you for the glory of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we thank you for the abundance that you brought through the people of High Point and what you've used it for to bless our community and our world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great Sunday.